Um, hello. So, as um, has been explained, part of my job is um, helping Alice and Matlock with their educational game program at Channel 4, which has given me the opportunity to uh, work on some really interesting games um, over the past sort of three or two or three years. Um, but I also do a lot of work in the entertainment game sector and in kind of the new, very rapidly growing uh, cultural game sector. Um, so what I thought would be interesting to do today would be to have a look at trends that we've seen emerging in really successful casual games that we know are doing a great job of attracting big audiences um, and achieving really good engagement with those and see how they apply to games that people are designing and producing in the educational sector. So um, that's the question that I'm starting to answer. What I don't want to get sidetracked in is to the inevitable um, fight since it is usually a fight <laughs> by the end of the afternoon, about what a casual game is. Um, so feel free to insert your favorite definition here, but I think we would all recognize what we mean um, in terms of uh, the kind of games that normally get uh, put under that umbrella. So, quick, crucial element, crucial part of casual game success is um, the fact that they're um, speedy to get into um, and easy to... Uh, play interstitially, snack gaming, things that you can just take advantage of um, in the few moments that you have. So something like Flight Control, which I suspect a number of you out there may have on your phones. A number of you may even be playing it right now. Be grateful that I can't see you too clearly. Um, very, very quick, very accessible um, game that, 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 you, you know, that you're into and playing within a kind of couple of seconds. And so that was that kind of approach to play um, was part of the inspiration behind something like uh, this, Sneeze, which was a component of um, uh, Channel 4's uh, project last year about uh, the implications uh, of advances in genetic science, uh, which was not an easy subject to make palatable and interesting to a teen audience. But this project, which included a documentary strand and uh, an ARG strand and a fictional drama strand, um, as alongside these mini games, um, did a very good job of doing this. So Sneeze, um, you can probably tell from the screenshot, is, is not a very serious game and it's not a very sophisticated game, but is a game which very, very neatly um, addresses this concept of infection vectors um, and a very simple message of public hygiene in terms of how important it is um, to cover your nose um, when you have the flu. Um, so this, by looking very closely at that, very straightforward proposition that we need things that are quick, we need things that, that fit into people's lives um, in a very, very, very rapid way where you're playing within, you know, four or five seconds of arriving on the page uh, was kind of incredibly important. Casual games also funny. This gets kind of neglected a lot. Um, in, the, in the arduous and unpleasant research that I had to do for this paper, um, I spent a little bit of time playing Winezilla, which is um, uh, an Amy Winehouse monster game where you rampage through London standing on paparazzi and shooting um, sun reporters down with your cigarette bazooka uh, in your effort to rescue your um, estranged husband from prison. Um, it's not sophisticated <laughs> and it's certainly not educational, but it is funny. Um, and it did, you know, it gave me that kind of instant moment of access um, and that instant uh, rapport that you don't always have with software that sets out to be educational or sets out to tackle serious subjects. So something that Alice, I think, talked about yesterday um, is coming from Channel 4 this year is, is a game called Privates, which is a, a, a sexual health game uh, which features in the starring role of Privates, a small squad of soldiers who are protected um, with condom hats from the terrible um, diseases and infections which they face in their day-to-day -day life of um, trying to combat various um, sexual infections. Um, and you're not laughing, but you should be laughing because it's a condom for a hat, and that is basically funny. Um, and particularly when you have a game that you're trying to target, you know, sort of 14 to 16-year-old boys, a crucial, crucial demographic for these educational principles, um, you can't come at this straight-faced. You can't, you can't not embrace this kind of approach. Um, social, obviously fantastically important. Um, anyone who has sat, um, as this person does, um, in, a, in a, a Farmville landscape, again, I'm sure many of you are familiar with this, are players of this on, on Facebook, um, which is a game which 
manipulates you quite directly by a dumping you in this lovely landscape and making it clear that you have no neighbours, you have no friends, you have this empty, lonely space around you with nobody for um, any kind of company, which gives you that instinct that you want to make connections, you want to have people around you. I think t Tom said earlier about the, the value of social play and how things are more fun when you have uh, a group of people around you. Um, and that was at, sort of at the heart um, of another project I've been involved with this year, which isn't out yet, uh, which is an iPhone game for Tate Modern. Um, which is predicated entirely around social play. So the idea that you are at the gallery often with other people, um, that, that, that um, part of the joy of going around galleries is that chance to compare notes, to compare perspectives, to share tastes and preferences and information. Um, so that's very much at the, at the heart of something um, like that. Um, but it's also about understanding that there's different kinds of sociability, that, that sociability, um, is this huge spectrum of stuff that goes from playing single player games in entirely single player infrastructures, but which are designed with the expectation that you will um, chat and contextualize what you're doing in that game with other people you know who may or may not be playing. Um, and it's really interesting to look at how you can better design single player games to have those social vectors embedded within them, even if you're not building any kind of infrastructure that supports them. Um, and they move right through the kind of social gaming that we're seeing um, arising more and more at the moment, and whether that's Farmville on Facebook or whether that's Wii Sports around the living room um, a coffee table. Um, there's a whole rich territory in there um, that also you know, contains Left 4 Dead and, and World of Warcraft and a whole bunch of kind of really rich um, digitally mediated social experiences. Um, and at the other end of the spectrum, you have kind of where we started with... Um, gaming with other people, which is in good old-fashioned head-to-head um, competitive uh, approaches to game design. Um, and these are still very powerful. They don't necessarily appeal to every sector of the game-playing public, but there are sectors for whom they're incredibly important. Um, so they're not always terribly visible because they're not necessarily the kind of flavor of the month um, game hits in, in terms of the things that people want to talk about. Um, so there's something like Vector City Racers, which is actually is huge on... Um, uh, Miniclip, uh, massively popular multiplayer game on Miniclip, uh, which is just a little top-down car racing and stunt driving game, uh, which is all about head-to-head -head competition, is all about um, having a better car, a better customised car, and a better set of scores and, and dominance um, than the people that you're playing against. These are really, really good drivers. Um, I'm sure Alice will have introduced you to, to 1066 yesterday. Um, this was a, a very useful um, history strategy game um, produced by Channel 4 uh, to cover the invasions um, of that year and um, had at its heart this great certainty that people would love to reenact these battles and love to test their metal against each other. Um, and it's, it's proved very popular in terms of a traditional multiplayer game. Um, and in terms of giving people opportunity to, to fight things out directly. So it's just important to remember when you're designing in when you are wanting to use the possibilities that social gaming give you in your project to think about all the different things that that can mean and all the different places along that spectrum, you can sit your game. And indeed, perhaps it sits on more than one of those uh, places on the spectrum, depending on, on how you're designing it and what kind of possibilities there are in it. Um, and casual games are always often also topical, which is something that can get missed a lot, I think, in the serious sector, because often we have too long run-ups and it's difficult to kind of respond really rapidly to what's um, going on. Um, so again, um, another, I can't, I can't recommend this little enough, I have to say, um, but this is Tiger Woods Outrun, which I was really disappointed to see is in, has nothing in any way to do with Outrun, which perhaps would have been a better um, bit of game design inspiration for it. Um, you drive along avoiding um, obstacles in your path and if you don't run fast enough, you're enraged. Um, soon to be ex-wife catches up with you and kills you with a golf club. Um, arguably educational about reasons that fidelity are useful in marriage, but, but basically just ridiculous. But tapping into the fact that these are the kind of people and the kind of stories that actually dominate most people's awareness of the world. These are the people you see in newspapers. These are the things that people are talking about. This is what's on radio, what's on TV. Often things that aren't reflected at all in... Um, most aspects of the games industry, certainly not really the, the, the mainstream AAA entertainment game industry and not necessarily very much in the educational games industry. 
Um, and it's something that is going to have influence on, on another Channel 4 project um, that I don't have a screenshot for, uh, which is Cover Girl, which is coming out this year, which is a game that looks at body image, um, digital ma manipulation of um, images um, in such a way as we're kind of losing our sense of uh, what is normal and what is not. Um, if you look very closely at the picture of this lovely lady, you'll see that, curiously, um, the bathroom tiles around her side um, are bendy <laughs> in the grouting, <laughs> um, because when whoever photoshopped it nipped in her waist, they also nipped in the tiles. Um, and we see all these images without sort of questioning, without understanding them, and making a game that takes um, this material, which is around us all the time, which is, is closely relevant, um, and works with it as a, as a platform for providing either education or entertainment, um, is, a, is a really, really powerful tool, I think, is being um, underused um, in kind of all uh, sectors of the games industry. But casual games are also a bunch of other things. They're simple. That's really, really crucial. We, we spoke about um, flight control at the beginning of this. Unbelievably simple game. You know, not even one button gaming. It's just one finger gaming. Um, so we know that's really powerful. We know that's a big part of what drove um, Sneezer's huge success. But um, they're also sometimes pretty complex. Um, I spent a fair bit of time, some of you also will have spent a fair bit of time with Gemcraft. Again, hugely popular, massive hit on Congregate. Um, this is a, a tower defense game. If any of you are veterans of desktop tower defense, lots of nasty little critters are going to come along that pathway and try and invade your little home hut at the bottom, and you need to mount armaments in those towers along the path to try and knock them out on their way forward. Um, except with this game, it's, it's magic, not armaments. Um, and so you're inserting gems into those towers to defeat the little beasties. The gems all have five or six different um, characteristics according to their shape and their color, and a few other things beside. All of those gems um, can be evolved and can be combined um, to form color combinations that I am not sure are part of a visible, visible spectrum, but which I'm clearly supposed to be able to handle as a, as a kind of a strategic tool. Um, it's unbelievably complicated. Everything that you, everything you put your mouse over, pops up this massive box with a list of stats. And even as somebody who's a veteran of, you know, tactics ogre and, and you know, too much Warcraft, this I, I find this kind of pretty challenging. And yet it has this huge audience who are very happy to absorb all of this information through it. Um, the other thing that often doesn't get talked about because it's a, it's a little bit kind of. Um, seems a little bit mean-spirited, is that a lot of casual games are very, 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 well, both very cheaply produced, but also have very, very low production values. So if you look at something like Warlords, um, is massive, has had a number of sequels, huge, huge following. Um, basically, you, you're trying to send your little guys from left to right, and your opponent is sending his guys from right to left. Um, and you're, if you see the yellow arrow on the far left, you're moving that up and down the screen and deploying troops at various timed intervals to try and meet the onrush of your enemy troops. It's, it's, it's very, very simple. But look at it. You don't want to be mean, but it's, it's really pretty bleak visually. And yet this can have huge resonance. We don't necessarily need to be aiming that high in terms of how we're presenting these games um, in order for them to find an audience. Um, except they can also be quite lavish. So um, if you look at something like Plants vs Zombies, Popcaps, massive investment over the last couple of years in developing this unbelievably lush casual game, which is full of incidental humor. Um, the longer you spend looking at the design of each of these different zombies and their costumes and their approaches, the more entertained you'll be. Um, full of little details, full of mini games, really lovely storytelling, beautifully composed music, um, absolute attention to detail at every single stage of the game production process. Um, and you know, has, has won huge plaudits and a huge audience because of it, because it's somewhere that feels um, so, um, it feels so sort of generous and focused as, as a piece of game design. Um, and another thing that often gets talked about is um, making games that fit with the female demographic, which, um, you know, until five to eight years ago maybe was seen as an untapped demographic, um, until you had a rival of games like uh, Dino Dash, which were hugely popular. Um, 
And it wasn't necessarily a shift to do with content. This obviously slightly stereotypically um, will make some people's blood boil, I'm sure, um, suggesting that the way that you make a female-friendly game is you make it about waiting tables and cooking meals for an unappreciative horde of people. Um, but actually, a lot of what um, fueled this game's success and many similar games is not so much the subject matter shift, it's a shift in control scheme uh, design, uh, it's a shift in uh, length of play session assumptions to produce things that are, are more uh, practical and more appealing to often a demographic who um, until recently did not necessarily grow up gaming and didn't necessarily have the same reflexes, the same love of um, complex um, and uh, uh, reaction-based game design that is often very popular um, in the male sector. And in another upcoming Gen 4 game, um, Ada, we've been looking very much at that because this is a game that aims to uh, encourage girls towards science careers. Um, and what we've not done is um, try and produce anything cute or pink um, or uh, kind of patronizing in its content, but we have thought a lot about control schemes. We've thought a lot about play patterns to make sure that we're producing something that um, is as appealing as possible to um, the intended demographic. Um, but you'd be forgiven for thinking that my kind of focus is slipping a bit because I slightly seem to be contradicting myself. Um, and I am a bit, because although lots of casual games are female-friendly, um, lots of them are male-focused, and quite a lot aren't really gender-specific. And the other thing about casual games is that lots of them are huge in scope. We've seen a few of those. Lots of people, I'm sure, are here familiar with RuneScape, something like that, absolutely massive. But lots of them are tiny. Some of them are Twitch-based. Some of them are absolutely about strategy. Some of them are free. Some of them are really cleverly monetized. Some of them are targeting very, very tiny niches. Some of them are really going for as wide an audience as they possibly can. Some have achieved what they have by targeting specific uh, game-specific platforms like DS or uh, the new download platforms on um, the, the home consoles. Some have proven that one of the ways that you can have a really big casual game success is to put it on a platform where there aren't many other games. So, you know, part of what led to the huge success of browser games was that something that people could do at work on work machines when they were supposed to be focused on other things. Some of them are really social. Um, some of them are incredibly solitary and are not about any of the social factors that I talked about early. Or some of them have accomplished their success by being incredibly easy to play and easy to master. Some of them are ruinously difficult um, and give a lot of complete, you know, of, of really traditional hardcore entertainment games around for their money. Some of them are throwaway things. Some of them have spawned huge IP empires. They're made by all kinds of people. The point is, it's a moving target. It's a totally moving target. The reason that casual games manage to achieve what they do is not because they have the secret formula, is not because they have a little structure that you can break down and copy. It's because there's millions of them happening all the time and there's a fantastic rate of attrition which allows the things that are left and the things that succeed to rise to the top. Um, and it's incredibly difficult, faced with that, to figure out a strategy that's going to enable your game to guarantee to get more attention, to get more time, to get more eyeballs than whatever happens to have risen to the top of this massive um, frothing pool of creativity, um, failure, and experimentation that is going on in the casual game scene. So the, the big, big challenge for the educational game sector, particularly in trying to create products that will um, capture attention at the very least alongside, if not away from, these kind of games, is to understand that the best way forward is not to copy the result, but to see how we can move towards copying the process. That looking at Farmville and going, well, Farmville works, let's make a Farmville, is by no means a guarantee of success because Farmville was what was needed to succeed 16 months ago, and by the time whatever you're making is ready, that target will have moved and something else will have, have revolutionized that space. What these guys have at their advantage is the ability to rapidly prototype, the ability to put out um, often quite flawed products, um, but then see how they do. Farmville, the, the, the degree of evolution within Farmville from its launch as a, as a really quite basic, fairly hobbled um, piece of game design to the kind of unbelievably dense um, and, and, and polished production that you have now was, was really, really um, interesting. And I think so often educational game projects have so many different stakeholders and so many different um, benchmarks and criteria that they have to fit within that you can end up with a development process that isn't responsive, that isn't aggressively experimental, 
um, because we need to work to all of those standards. And finding a way to get a, perhaps a better balance between meeting those incredibly important standards, but being more anarchic, more experimental, and more throwaway in our game design approaches towards them, I think is, is what's going to take us forward um, into the, the, the world that we've heard about from Richard and Tom already, in terms of really finding these tools at the forefront of how we learn um, and how we expand our horizons. Um, and that's my synthesis of um, casual and educational game design. Thank you. Thank you very much, Margaret. Are there any questions for Margaret? I'm sure there aren't. Yes, <laughs> Tom. Hi, sorry, I'll say it again. Um, I was interested, uh, you've half answered it already, but what you think are the, just the two or three absolute best for you casual games out there, what really embody, embody the, the, the cream of it? Um, I, I, think, I think it's not a cop-out to decline to answer that, because that suggests that there's some kind of apex that they're aiming towards, and there just isn't. If you look at something like Plants vs. Zombies, um, well, the... the there's some stuff I could say about it in terms of things it doesn't quite get right, but it's incredibly accomplished um, and, you know, and, and very, very beautiful and very carefully judged in terms of the difficulty curve and full of humor, full of character, full of strategic challenge, very, very smart game. Um, is it the best casual game? Well, no, because it depends who you are. It depends what you're looking for. Um, and I think, I mean, I think a lot of people have moved beyond casual gaming as a, as a useful descriptor. I, and I, I think that's almost certainly the case. I think the idea that it's more about modes of play that, that you can play almost any game in a hardcore way or a casual way, um, but, you know, I think is, you know, I'm a very casual player of Bayonetta, um, which a bunch of you may know is a, yeah, let's not go into explaining Bayonetta. Um, but that's a game which is in, you know, is a lot of depth and, and very, very great skill behind it, none of which I appreciate at all. I pick it up for half an hour and mash the buttons, laugh at the pretty pictures, go away and do something else. So I'm definitely a casual player of that very hardcore game. Um, in terms of what I play the most every day, it's an iPhone game called Drop7. Uh, which I commend to you all. It's got very, very good arithmetical and strategic thinking um, requirements embedded within it. Um, and I, I've played it, I think, every day for maybe the last two years. <laughs>